On a still morning in Virginia, Nicole Hannah-Jones remembers. You are standing on sacred land. Here on this shoreline in Fort Monroe, she's paying tribute to the first enslaved Africans who arrived in America in the year 1619. With our sister, our beloved Nicole Hannah-Jones here, we must tell the truth and have the courage to speak forth. The date is fundamental to the journalist's most well-known piece of work, the 1619 Project, in which she argues that slavery's legacy shapes everything in our democracy. You can look at the insurrection on January 6th. You can look at all of the efforts in states to restrict voting. You can look at why are we the most carceral nation in the world. I don't feel like my job takes courage. And it's the debate like over that year that's made Hannah Jones one of the most lauded and vilified public figures in America today. We should all take the 1619 Project as a story about America. This is not black American history. This is American history. What was your inspiration for the 1619 Project? I learned about the year 1619 in a uh, one semester black studies elective that I took in high school. There was a power both in understanding that black people had actually been here almost as long as the English settlers, which no one had ever taught us. Her new book, The 1619 Project, A New Origin Story, argues slavery isn't just part of the American story, it's central to it. Would you say that you're reframing the history or rewriting the history? We're not rewriting it because, one, um, everything in the 1619 Project is based off of decades of uh, historical scholarship, uh, but we're certainly reframing it. The daughter of a black father and a white mother from Waterloo, Iowa, she says she felt the disparities firsthand between her black and white relatives. My uh, black grandmother was born in 1924 in Greenwood, Mississippi, where black people couldn't vote, where black people couldn't attend whatever schools they wanted to, where black people couldn't go to the library. And my white grandfather was born in 1924. And as a white man, he could do all of those things. The 1619 Project is her brainchild, first published in a special edition of the New York Times Magazine in 2019. It was a sensation. Supporters celebrated its message of inclusivity and diversity. The magazine now selling on eBay for $500. And Hannah Jones even won the highly esteemed Pulitzer Prize. But as her star rocketed, controversy followed closely behind. Her social media became a magnet for outrage and ire. Hannah Jones fired back. And when people try to discredit my work, I felt like I had to be out there doing battle. I regret that, absolutely. And then in 2020 came her most high-profile detractor of all, the President of the United States. The left has warped, distorted, and defiled the American story. There is no better example than the New York Times totally discredited 1619 Project. Trump even signed an executive order creating a 1776 commission with the goal of teaching patriotic education. Frankly, that commission was just doubling up on the education that most of our kids receive, which is a fairly whitewashed education uh, that is not really telling um, us an accurate depiction of, of our country. The 1619 Project became linked with the debate over critical race theory, or CRT, a decades-old academic theory that argues racism has been built into the institutions of our nation and looks at racism through a systemic lens. People who are saying critical race theory are really saying the teaching of racism and uh, the history of racism. The 1619 Project has gotten lumped in with that because it centers black Americans and it centers slavery. The 1619 Project is a work of journalism. It's not critical race theory. But she says she does support teaching critical race theory in schools. What do you say to parents who say that critical race theory is just a way to make white children feel guilty about the sins of the past. I don't know any educators that are telling white children that they are responsible for the sins of their ancestors. But we should collectively feel shame for slavery. It's not shame because that child is white. It's shame because that is a shameful part of our history. But others took aim at her sourcing. Sean Wilentz is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and professor of history at Princeton University. He and a group of fellow historians wrote a letter to the New York Times Magazine saying there were factual errors and misleading material in the original project. The most egregious inaccuracy had to do with the American Revolution. Um, 
it was stated that one of the primary reasons for the revolution was the American colonists wanted to protect the institution of slavery, which is simply not true. She cites the case of, of James Somerset, who was a slave in Virginia, went to Great Britain, mm -hmm. asked for his freedom then, and a judge ruled in his favor. Do you think that that gives any validity, any credibility to the point that she's trying to make? No, that's been debunked. The idea that the Somerset case did anything to uh, make American slaveholders nervous about the, about the possibility that Britain was going to um, uh, you know, abolish slavery, that's just absurd. But Hannah Jones disputes that criticism. You can say, uh, maybe I worded it strong, more strongly than you would as a historian, but you can't say that there's no evidence to back up the claim. We peer reviewed that section with several historians of that era. Um, and there are more than a thousand endnotes in this book. Our job as historians is to consider the, you know, the, the validity of the evidence. There's always going to be conflict. But the point is, you have to remain true to the actual historical record. If you're not doing that, then you're doing something very pernicious. But educators like Chicago high school teacher Rebecca Coven say the 1619 Project is only enriching students' educations. You guys all read for homework The Idea of America, which is by Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is the editor of the 1619 Project. I want my students to think critically about the information they consume and to never accept anything as fact. And the 1619 Project, to me, was filling a gap that exists in the curriculum. For the past two years, she's used excerpts in her history and English classes. I was finally getting a perspective I have never learned about. Her students have even published their own edition of the 1619 Project, examining issues plaguing their community in Rogers Park, Chicago. I specifically did an article on health inequities because we have a clinic in our school and showing how that can help communities and help students get the proper care that they need. The section I worked on was redlining. And that really helped me understand how racism and racial discrimination is, real, is a real thing and it happens in the U.S. even today. But Ms. Coven does admit there were challenges in the beginning. It's personal for a lot of students. There were times when people had to, like, w walked out the room, getting in arguments with each other. But it's the conversations that we had afterwards to repair harm, to process what had happened that... I think was a huge learning point for a lot of us. The students have even taken what they've learned to enact change. They have organized to remove police from our school. They have started the Black Lives Matter Week of Action. They have seen through the 1619 Project, I too can use my voice to not just identify injustices, but take action and rally others around that action as well. Last year, millions took action, protests erupting around the world following the death of George Floyd, demanding justice and equality. Do you feel that we are in a time of racial reckoning, or is this, as you describe in the book, the myth of racial progress? Definitely, um, this is the myth of racial progress. We were at the cusp of reckoning, but it was very fleeting. What we are most comfortable with as Americans is saying, yes, it was bad back then, but it's not like that anymore. And yes, we have inequality now, but one day in the future, it's going to get better. And then that alleviates us of, of the need to act. She says one way to help, financial reparations, cash payments from the federal government to descendants of the enslaved. My argument is, Let's face up to the truth, collectively saying, we did a great wrong. What do we do to make it right? You have an 11-year-old daughter. Yes. Do you feel that in her lifetime she will see justice? Is it possible that we can get a reparations bill passed in her lifetime? It's possible. But will she know equality? No, I don't think so. Give black people reparations and black people will still suffer from police violence or from uh, discrimination in the housing market. But uh, if black people did not have this gaping lack of wealth, they would be able to move into safer neighborhoods. To go to college without having the largest student loan debt of all racial groups. After 402 years of what many argue is inequality, Hannah Jones concedes the justice she seeks may be elusive, but that certainly is not stopping her from pursuing it. I um, have long studied the way that black women in particular who speak up against power, who dare challenge narratives, get treated. And I can just tell you, I, I'm built for this. It's OK.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.